All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome. We are just getting started with the Business Develop Protein monthly seminar. My name is Audrey Gear, and I'm a Startup Innovation Specialist at the Good Food Institute. So today we will be diving into manufacturing and building the infrastructure you need to scale your business. Before we begin, I do just have a few housekeeping items to quickly go over. Uh, first of all, for those unfamiliar, the Good Food Institute is an international nonprofit organization that is developing the roadmap for sustainable, secure, and just protein supply. We identify the most effective solutions, we mobilize resources and talent, and we empower partners across the food system to make alternative proteins accessible, affordable, and delicious. Uh, secondly, the seminar will be recorded and posted to our YouTube channel. A copy of the recording will be also be emailed to registrants after the presentation. You can also view previous seminars on our YouTube channel. Uh, third, the seminar will include an audience Q&A for the last part of the hour. We ask that you please ask your questions in the Q&A box rather than the chat. You're welcome to ask questions throughout the seminar, but we will likely address them towards the end. And finally, immediately following the seminar, we will be hosting a virtual networking session via the Meetaway platform. Uh, we'll drop the link in the chat right now that will take you to the registration page where you can sign up if you haven't already. And this is just a great opportunity to meet other professionals in the all protein industry. You'll be matched with several other people for one-on-one -on -one conversations. And I know that I've met some fantastic people at these mixers. So I really encourage all of you to join us. Just remember, you do need to sign up via Meetaway to access the networking, and this will start at the top of the hour once this seminar ends. So with that, let's dive into today's seminar. I am pleased to welcome David Ziskind, who leads the Next Gen Ag team as Director of Engineering at Black & Beach. David has a wealth of experience and has worked on dozens of design build projects in the food and beverage industry, with clients ranging from startups to Fortune 500 companies. David, we are so lucky to have you here today, and I will now hand it over to you to take it from here. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you, Audrey, and thank you to the Good Food Institute for having me today. Um, you know, as Audrey mentioned, so I'm with uh, Black & Veatch, uh, in particular NextGen Ag, which is our solution focused on food tech, new and emerging um, products and technologies. From a personal standpoint, um, I'm an electrical engineer by background, but as Audrey mentioned, done a lot in the project management space uh, from a design build standpoint in the food and beverage industry. Um, sampling of the projects I've worked on, everything from uh, establishing a new bourbon production facility to working with an existing manufacturer to roll out a new to market product uh, to new to new product formulation and roll out for a plant based meat product. Uh, so currently focused really heavily in the alternative protein space. And I like to use my food industry experience to work with clients to really mitigate risk on high risk and fast track pro projects. Um, certainly welcome your connection on LinkedIn and we can, um, you know, we can certainly discuss things further. So what, what we want to try and cover today um, you know, within this webinar, we, we're just going to be able to touch on some of these topics, but wanted to give you a broad, broad idea from an infrastructure standpoint, um, you know, what's required from a manufacturing standpoint, what do we have to think about as you look to commercialize your food, your food tech, your alternative protein product, how do we make sure we get that to market um, effectively and efficiently? So I'll give you a very quick introduction uh, to my firm, Black & Veatch. And then diving into things, um, the economics of a factory. What does it really take to build a food plant from an infrastructure and the cost standpoint? What are some of the things you need to think about? I've also got what I call the project roadmap. So I also call it the importance of planning. What are some of the things you need to think about on this journey, on this process? How do we, how do we commercialize that product? How do we get to commercial scale effectively and efficiently? Talk a little bit about manufacturing strategy considerations, whether you consider, is this a facility you're, you are going to own, you are going to you know, design, build, and operate it, whether you're going to use a co-packer, things like that. Talk a little bit about risk, ideas for managing risk, and then uh, certainly welcome a, um, a ro robust question and answer session. 
Okay, so very briefly, Black and Veatch. So we've been around since 1915. We have this 100 plus year legacy of sustainably solving these global infrastructure challenges. We use through um, our expertise in innovation and sustainability. We've got over 9,000 professionals, 100 offices worldwide, 100% employee owned company. Um, and we really work closely with our clients just to figure out what the right solution is, no matter the project size, no matter the location. So that's broader Black and Veatch. And the next gen ag is hyper focused on technology and manufacturing scale up for food, agriculture, and industrial biotech pro products. This space is a little different than traditional food and beverage in that you might not have your entire process defined or things may be um, being refined and evolved in a very rapid manner. So that's really what we specialize in, in helping you, um, helping you do that efficiently. It's, part, it's our mission. You know, we're, we're building a world of difference, particularly through sustainable infrastructure, sustainable manufacturing. And then our next gen ag tagline, I like to sum it up, better food, better planet. That's what we're focused on. We're helping companies bridge this gap between science, research and development, engineering and commercialization. Okay, so let's dive in. Economics of a factory. What does it take to build a food plant? So one of the things that as we go through this that uh, I want you to consider and think about in particular is, is your board communication, how you're communicating to the board your board, what's involved from a cost and schedule standpoint. These are things that we want to make sure you understand up front, you're able to communicate effectively to your board so that you understand all the costs that are involved and um, ha have a better chance for success in this area. So some things to consider as we're talking about this food plant. So certainly there's the technology itself. What are you doing? What does that look like? We're gonna look at technology readiness levels here in a moment. Um, sustainability aspect, what level of sustainability are you looking at? What does that look like? How does that match up with your objectives? Do you have a mission or are you, know, are you working towards decarbonization? Um, part of the sustainability consideration is certainly cost as well as availability of certain utilities. Uh, for example, if you look at, uh, you know, in areas of the country, the cost of natural gas versus electric, for example, whereas you may want to go one way from a sustainability angle, but, you know, a cost angle may at least temporarily push you a different way. So things to consider, things to look at, and how that really plays together. So the big one I have here in quotes, site selection criteria. So this to me, this is really the core, and this is very important as part of your strategy um, you know, one of your choices is you come in with your site selection criteria. You say, I need this size facility. I need these utilities. It needs to generally be in this avail in this area from a transportation standpoint. And you go from there. Another option is perhaps you have an existing site. You have an identified site. You're co-locating with someone, whatever that might be. You could start from that angle, but you're inherently starting with some constraints there, right? You don't have that blank slate. Um, but things that you're thinking about are certainly location. Where is this going to be? The size, what the facility size is. What does future expansion look like? Is this a facility we just need for current needs? Do we want to be able to expand in this specific facility on this specific, um, you know, in this specific facility on this specific plot? Do we want to look at other areas? What do we need from a, an expandability, future expansion standpoint? Zoning and permitting is another consideration. So are we looking at a rural area? Are we looking at a suburban area? Are we looking at an urban area? Are there considerations from a zoning and permitting standpoint? There's the cost consideration, but there's also the timing. If you're looking at zoning, you could be looking at, uh, again, depending on the jurisdiction, potentially significant, uh, significant schedule impact. Um, transportation, so how you're getting how you're getting raw materials in, how you're getting product out, what labor looks like. And it's not just cost these days, it's labor availability. How do you make sure you're in the right population center where you have the right level of potentially skilled labor available um, in, the right, in the right area so that you can effectively um, operate your facility? 
And then the big one, utilities, this infrastructure piece. So everything from electrical to water to wastewater, uh, all these things are very important and you should definitely not consider them as a given and just as a available. So depending on the, the um, municipality you're looking at, they might be tapped out from an infrastructure standpoint. They might not be able to produce more water or they might be have restrictions from a wastewater standpoint, whether it's the quantity of wastewater, the characteristics of wastewater. So you have to look at these things and consider as you're looking at what does your ideal site look like. I also talk about phases. So one of the concepts is maybe you do, you do a phased approach to your plant. So maybe you start off, for example, on a large enough plot of land or a large enough facility where you can expand in the future. Maybe you're building out in a couple of phases. That's another thing to consider. And what does that look like? Um, just backing up one moment to a specific example as we look at that site selection criteria of do you go in with the what is your criteria or do you start with a specific facility? One thing we commonly run into, particularly as we look at, at um, the cultivated meat and uh, fermentation technologies is ceiling height. You potentially have some large vessels. What's the right height? What's the right facility? Do you have enough space to bring in your equipment? So just another example of those things to consider. And then finally, the big one, the money piece. What is it going to cost from a capital standpoint? And what is it going to cost from an ongoing annual operational expense standpoint? So I want to take that and talk a little bit more on the technology piece. So looking at these technology readiness levels, um, you know, what, what phase you're in going through this, this TRL approach, one through nine, the scale in liters um, I use from a colleague, I'd call it an example scale, you know, gives you an idea from an order of magnitude standpoint. We typically consider TRLs one through three. That's really your science. That's getting it from a lab standpoint figuring it out um, on through TRL four through six. That's where you start doing the, the real engineering. Um, that's where you're looking at generally a pilot facility. And then TRL seven through nine, that's where you're going commercial. You're commercializing it. You're looking at your commercial facility. So at TRL one, that's really taking the concept. Okay, you've got this idea. You've got the basic science. You've got the research. Here's our idea. Um, we, we have an idea what we're doing, but we're, we're really trying to refine it and, and crystallize it. So TRL2, we're still in that lab scale, but we figured out the commercial, the technology is going to satisfy the identified need. We've got a value proposition. We know what we're working towards. TRL3 on the lab scale is really focused on repeatability. Can you repeat this process? Do you have that quantitative verification that this concept works? You understand your core technology and you start working on your preliminary techno, techno economic analysis, which we'll talk about in a moment. Then we move on. So we've gone through lab, then we're into the pilot. So we're looking at TRL four through six. So starting with TRL four, we've got our conceptual design, starting to put together maybe process flow diagrams. We're refining our techno-economic analysis. We know a little bit more from a cost standpoint. TRL5, we're really developing that. We've got um, tests. We're producing samples of the final product. So maybe this is where we're doing our sales samples. We're starting to optimize in the pilot stage the process based on the techno-economic anal analysis. TRL6, so we're starting to transition out of that pilot stage. Generally, we say you're at least one one hundredth of your commercial scale. Uh, you're gathering data. This is really your experimentation. You're getting more information. You're using that to drive your process. And how do you how do you use that data in your techno-economic analysis as you're optimizing for commercial? Then TRL seven through nine. This is where we're again we're we're marching towards that commercialization aspect. TRL seven. You're probably call it one tenth of your commercial scale demonstration facility. You've got, uh, we call it continuous operation of a thousand hours. So you've got some repeatable processes. Uh, you understand, you start to understand some of the risks. You're documenting the performance. And then moving on to TRL8, getting really close here. You know your operating conditions. 
Your investor might be validating some specific pilot runs with independent engineering. You've got a detailed process model through to TRL9. And that's where we're deploying commercially. Your first commercial scale plant, um, you know your operations are going to meet the cost, the yield, the productivity estimates, everything that you need to get out of it. You might still refine in the future for future expansion or future facilities, but that's really that's really the, po the path, the, the technology readiness levels to get from the concept to that commercial facility. So just some things to think about when you think about where you are in that in that process. So I mentioned the techno-economic analysis. So sort of backing into it like it sounds, this is where you're analyzing the economics of the process of the technology, doing some software modeling. You're looking at the costs, your capital costs, your operating costs, which we'll talk about in a moment, and your revenue based on your inputs and based on your outputs. You're using this to figure out economic feasibility, maybe help guide and direct your research and development where are some areas you want to focus on and optimize. Um, this helps you to narrow in and even quantify uncertainty and risk. Where are those uncertain areas? Where do we need to put more of our efforts to refine as we as we go through this process? So uh, you know, we've got this model. We look at this mass and energy balance. So really just think of it of what's going into the process, what's going out. From a simple standpoint, you've probably got some feedstock, feedstocks going in, you're using utilities, and you're getting out of it, you're hopefully getting your, your ideal product out, but you're also getting some level of waste. And what does that look like? And that's something that you need to consider what you're going to do with that waste in addition to the product. Start looking at analyzing the profitability, and then start looking from a, a sensitivity standpoint, because there is a degree degree of uncertainty. Where do things really fall? Where do we have more confidence? Where do we have less confidence? And start to quantify that. So capital cost estimate. So uh, I want to talk through, this is not necessarily a comprehensive list, but want to give you an idea of things to think about, particularly, uh, you know, I've had some companies I work with think of it from an equipment standpoint of, hey, we know what our equipment costs. That's really all this is going to cost. And my argument is, no, that, that's really just the, just the start of this process. Um, so you've got your actual process equipment that's producing your end product. You've got the facility that you need to be in, or we call core and shell. So whether you're building your own facility, whether you're leasing a building, whatever it is, you need that base facility. You need your, your four walls and a roof, right? Then we go in beyond that to your process utility. So this is one area that often people overlook, but these process utilities, again, are not the, they're not necessarily the most exciting part of your process. They're not part of your core process per se, but they're necessary in order to make your process function. These are things like water treatment. Um, you know, if you need a certain level of process water, this is uh, any refrigeration that's needed. These are things like an air compressor, any gas generation, gases, things like that. Uh, any of these specialized, what I call process utilities that are necessary to make the process work. Then we have to install everything. So you probably have to install your equipment, your process utilities. Um, th those are the core areas. One of the other costs you have to consider is engineering costs. Typically, you're seeing anywhere from 8 to 12% of your capital cost going into engineering. So doesn't matter whether you're doing that in-house, whether you're using an, uh, a third-party firm, whether it's Black & Beach or others. Um, these are costs you need to consider in your, in your capital cost. So if you have your own people doing this, there's a cost associated with that, right? You need to hire people focused on this who are going to be focused on this and not other aspects of scale-up. There's a construction management aspect. So you're ready to build, you're ready to install, you don't just hire a contractor and say, here you go, see you in so many months. You're monitoring this process. You're making sure it's installed the way you want it installed. You're answering questions, things like that. There's a contractor's, uh, what I call a contractor's risk fee. So if you're having a contractor wrap this into a design build or engineer procure construct arrangement, the contractor is taking some level of risk or doing this uh, on your behalf. And there's going to be a fee associated with that. The final piece that I emphasize, no matter whether it's your um, 
your, your process that you're working up or even a project you're doing around the house, contingency. There are always going to be these costs that are coming up um, that were not expected, not planned. Things happen that, that were those unknowns. So there's some level of contingency you want to include in your capital costs to make sure that when they occur, not if they occur, but when, when they occur, because you're going to have at least something happen that's unexpected, you've got the right capital set up to address that. So then from capital, the other piece that's important to consider are the operating costs, your operational expense. So these are your manufacturing costs. You've got some direct costs, you've got some indirect costs, and then you've got some fixed costs. Everything from raw materials, what goes into this process, the labor of how you're actually going to, you've got equipment, who's going to run the equipment, who's going to take care of the facility, maintenance, there's some ongoing maintenance aspects, any of your consumables that are going into this process, the utilities that are required. So utility costs can be a, a significant factor if you're using a lot of, you know, electrical or water or natural gas, for example, your laboratory quality control, even things like waste disposal, general facility overhead, and then some of those fixed costs like depreciation, insurance, and other things to consider on an annual basis. So just expanding a little bit further on some of those annual operating costs, you've got your specific process-related ones, you've got um, raw materials, you, such as the feedstocks, the chemicals, you've got various consumables, all sorts of utilities, you've got waste going out, and then administrative, broadly administrative. I mean, you've got maintenance, you've got labor that we had mentioned, even the transportation, what's it costing to get the raw materials in? What is it costing to get the product out? Are you going to an intermediate warehouse? Things like that. And then other things like what are your validation costs, sales costs, research and development, all sorts of things to really think about that are key for um, as part of these operational costs. So when we think about the capital process, we use the lexicon uh, front-end planning, FEP, or sometimes uh, known as front-end loading, FEL. It's the idea that you've got these three, um, consider them stage gates that you're going through, really this feasibility, conceptual, to your detailed scope. And at each stage, you're refining the process, you're getting a little more certain, um, but this is part of the process, and we're going to dive just a little deeper into that in a moment. But your, your FEL or FEP1, this is really where you're looking at your feasibility. What does the technology look like? What's our design basis? What does our base process look like? Starting to think about the site selection piece. What does the, the project schedule look like? What's our initial capital cost? And then as we go through these, we're starting, you know, our, our deliverables start getting a little longer, but we're also refining, right? So like risk assessment is constant throughout. We're refining through the process, your project schedule, we're refining it, getting more detailed, and even your capital cost estimate. So when we sum this up, so we look at, you know, as you're moving towards this, uh, towards your final design, towards your construction, we start looking at, there's a level of project definition. Of course, as your project definition increases, your cost estimate accuracy is going to, um, the accuracy is gonna increase with that uncertainty going down. So typically at the feasibility stage, we're looking at plus or minus 50% cost estimate. Um, then we're moving in as we refine, maybe we're getting to a plus or minus 30. So we've gone from that order magnitude to budgetary, to a really bankable number, plus or minus 10%. And it's really about the level of detail that we're going through to get this. So initially, feasibility, we might be just be looking at equipment and say, hey, let's assign a factor to it. Let's assign a percentage of what it might cost. Of course, there's going to be a wider range of uncertainty in that cost. As we narrow in, we start going through material takeoffs. We have an idea of what installation looks like. Maybe we know about how long the electrical run is, the piping runs are, we can start putting some of that data together to get a better idea. And then we get into a real detailed stage where we're going into the detailed, what is it going to cost to build this? And you get a much more certain number. So as you imagine, as you start and, and visually, you see these, these stages getting 
longer, right? As you're going through that one through three stage, this front end planning or front end loading, it's taking a little longer from a schedule standpoint. It's starting to cost a little more money from an engineering standpoint. Okay, so why is why is all this important? Why is that, everything I'm talking about, why is that important? So I want to look at this, what I call the project definition approach, the project roadmap. What is it going to cost you to scale? How much funding do you need? Um, what, what's the right approach? I want to make sure that you're going in with the information that you can present to your board, to your investors, so that you have the right number, so that you can successfully continue through with your fundraising and get all the way to that commercial scale operating facility. So first thing I like to look at is a simple triangle. You probably heard the uh, uh, the saying good, fast, cheap, pick two, right? Or in the project management um, terms, you've got your scope, cost, and schedule with sort of quality playing out in the middle. One of the things I like to put on this triangle instead is flexibility. So we've got we've got to balance our cost. We've got to balance our schedule with the flexibility. Uh, I've sometimes said, you know, when, when someone says they want, you know, a lot of flexibility, I say, hey, if you cut infinite cost, if you got infinite money, if you got infinite time, then we can probably deliver somewhere around infinite flexibility, right? No, no one has all the money to spend on whatever. No one has all the time in the world. So how do we balance this out? How do we get the right level of flexibility balanced within your cost constraints, balanced within your time constraints? So a little refinement on this project, uh, I'm calling project roadmap, and you'll sort of see a similar approach as that front end loading or front end planning. Uh, so I look at, you've got your feasibility, then you're going in your detailed design, then you're going into execution. And we're going to look in a moment why, why this is so important, and in particular, why I think it is so important to focus on this front section, this feasibility piece. Look at some of the deliverables and items we're talking about here. This is when we're thinking about strategy. We're talking about master planning. What does that facility look like? How big is it? What is your strategy there? We're looking at that basic conceptual design. We're using a project charter to get all the stakeholders aligned, make sure the, the board, the um, you know founders, you, your partners are all in line on what we're trying to do, what we're looking to accomplish, our objectives, our scope, um, and in particular, in working with external partners to help make sure everyone's aligned. Risk matrix is certainly key. We'll talk about risk in a moment. Um, you know, again, on the master planning piece, you know, wh what are your needs in one year, three year, five years? Let's not just build what we need right now today. We want to be thinking a number of years ahead. Uh, and of course, you know, one, one of the um, plays there, or one of the things to consider is if you're looking at a short time frame, what happens when you're running out of space in six months or a year, and instead of expanding in your current area, now you're having to build a totally different facility that's going to take more time and cost more money. So key output, I think of in this initial feasibility piece is really having a good idea of that capital budget estimate. You've validated that number. You've got some third-party information. You've got some real numbers to understand, hey, what is it going to take from a cost standpoint to actually build this commercial facility? So, but why, why is that so important up front? Why, why do we want to do that? There are all these other stages. Uh, sometimes in a schedule crunch, one of the things I, I hear is, hey, we just need to move quickly. We need to go into detailed design. Let's just execute this thing. Let's just get it going. Um, you know, why, why is that important? Let, let's move fast. Let's break things. We got to go, right? Well, there's a cost impact to that. And there was a time impact to that. And I want to look at that on this next slide. So uh, I just want to, I just want to reemphasize that piece about being a mistake to skip that initial feasibility, skipping that initial stakeholder alignment, project definition, initial risk assessment, even broad you know, capital cost on a plus or minus 50% basis. That's very critical to establish up front. That is where, as we look at this influence curve, and if there is just, if I could leave you with only one thing to take away from this webinar, this would really be the core piece, is this influence curve, this project life cycle, looking at the opportunity for, to influence over the project 
looking at the costs and looking at the life cycle. So when you're iterating through on the feasibility stage, you can do several feasibility studies. This is where you can make lots of pivots. You're just doing it effectively from a, a design standpoint. This is all desktop work. So you haven't built anything. You don't have detailed design. You haven't spent a lot of engineering money. This is trying to figure things out. So sometimes we'll have clients that go through several feasibility, different approaches of what if we do this? What if we do that? What if we do this other option? What do those look like? Because we're not just validating the technology. We're also understanding what those costs are involved, what the impact is, and what that really looks like. So in particular, I like to look in the middle where you see that we say rapidly decreasing influence. Look at that sharp linear drop in detailed design. So once you've figured out, hey, this is the path we're going, once you've started that process, once you're designing the facility, uh, designing the equipment, specifying everything, maybe even purchasing long lead equipment, that opportunity to influence things from a time standpoint drops and any changes you want to make at that standpoint from that standpoint are rapidly increasing from a cost perspective. If you have to do changes there, certainly better to do it then than in the execution stage where you're actually building, but it's definitely more expensive than doing it in the feasibility stage. The last thing I'll say about that is, you know, we certainly want to balance this from a, I think from an engineering standpoint, uh, you know, you sometimes can get lost in this analysis paralysis. You know, you want to go through every possible iteration, every possible um, idea, and that might take a lot of time and cost a lot of money, right? So we're we're trying to strike the balance here of if you've got different ideas, if you've got different things to prove it out, let's do that work up front. Let's do it in the feasibility stage. We're not going to necessarily have all the answers, but let's increase our chances of project success, increase or rather decrease the time it's going to take, um, and decrease the costs that are going to be involved as opposed to changing those later. So again, this is the main takeaway. I, I hope you're able to take away this point in particular. And these are really all things you need in this process as you're looking at design. There are a number of different options of where you can get them. Certainly, it's one thing Black & Veatch does. It's another thing you could hire your own personnel and do in-house. Good Food Institute has a great database of industry consultants available on their website to look at as well. My point is, really doesn't matter who does it. The, the point is, it needs to be done. It needs to be considered so that you are able to um, uh, you know, have a well-defined project and meet your timeline and meet your costs. So looking at that, again, why, why I keep talking about this project definition piece, get, get that better cost certainty get that schedule refined, reduce that risk. So particularly within the feasibility stage, and that gets you to this better cost certainty, higher confidence for that investor term bankability. A um, couple of other things that can be done in here in addition to the engineering, this is where you might consider an independent engineering review. So let's say you've done the engineering work in house, maybe you hire a third party firm to validate that and that gives your investors more confidence. Similar if you hire one firm to do this initial work, maybe you have another firm co come behind and doing some independent engineering, we sometimes call a red flags review to review it and make sure, hey, all this makes sense, or there are some walkshouts that we haven't considered here. So one thing I did want to mention as we think about, and maybe you've heard some of these terms, as we think about building, as you start going down that build path of, hey, let's build this facility, what does that really look like? So you may have heard terms like design build or EPC, engineer procure construct, or EPCM, engineer procure and construction manage. Really, these are all effectively just contracting terms that balance, uh, I put, I call it the contracting spectrum. They balance the risk transfer from you as the owner to a contractor or engineer. And of course, there's a cost associated with that. So what we call E little p CM, that's where a firm is doing engineering. They're effectively helping you figure out, hey, what do you need to buy? They're helping to oversee the construction, but they're not buying anything directly. They're saying, hey, this is what you need to buy. Here's what you need to do. We'll help oversee it. Um, you know, the cost there is going to be relatively low because from a risk transfer standpoint, 
the contractor engineer has fairly little risk. They're doing the work, but you know, if uh, most of that risk is coming to you as the owner, then you start moving in a shared risk model where maybe the, the contractor, the engineer has some quote unquote skin in the game. So there's a cost impact, maybe on a technology prove out, um, cost schedule, whatever that might be. Of course, as you're starting to transfer that risk, the cost goes up. Then you look at uh, what we call an open to close book engineer procure construct. So that's where you're saying, hey, up to a certain extent, yes, you know, the engineering firm or the contractor is buying everything. All the costs are open and, and transparent up to a certain point until we say, okay, let's close the book on this thing. Um, you know, this is the cost we've agreed to. We need to build it for this cost. And then all the way at the risk transfer side. So you, you are at the owner taking on relatively little risk, but you're paying a higher cost is when we look at something like a lump sum engineer procure construct. That's where you're saying, okay, engineering partner, contractor, I want you to design this facility that does this and I'm agreeing to do it um, for this amount of money. And you know, you're not seeing a lot in terms of cost. You're giving a lot of that control to the uh, to the contractor, to the engineering firm to do it. You're getting the guarantee from a you know potentially schedule and cost standpoint, but you're having a little less influence. You're also increasing your cost and as you transfer that risk on out, outside of you to that engineer or to that contractor. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about uh, from an infrastructure standpoint, what it looks like to build a facility, some of the costs there. I wanna delve into just for a couple of minutes, looking at this manufacturing strategy considerations. The reason that I added this topic in here is, is one of the questions I sometimes get is, we're not building a facility, we're just going with a contract manufacturer. And that, that's, a, that's certainly an approach, but one of the things I want people to understand is what are the trade-offs between contract manufacturing and having your own facility? There's no right answer. There's no, you must do it this way or you must do it that way. But I think it's an important consideration to think about as you think about your manufacturing strategy. So I've got a couple of news articles over the past two years to really, this just, to me, this just emphasizes why this decision, why this manufacturing strategy is so important. Uh, there was an article about Danone bringing um, all, all their functions and team effectively under the same roof to make this single integrated team. General Mills, there's this article about they were using contract manufacturing to meet demand. And then an interesting one in, in our industry, as we think about um, uh, contract manufacturing and alternative protein, there were these two uh, um, almost juxtaposed news articles I thought were interesting. Um, you know, it's not about the company that was involved. It's about the contract manufacturing strategy and just the different different things that come into play there. In one case, you know, this one article talks about uh, some legal issues with a, a contract manufacturer, and this other article talks about the the company actually acquiring a contract manufacturer in order to address some of their unit costs. So, um, very interesting ideas. The point is, all these companies had a plan to address the whole manufacturing strategy piece, and sometimes iterated along the way to respond to these market changes. So manufacturing strategy approaches, really two main ones to consider. You're either producing it in your own facility, so your in-house production, um, or you're outsourcing to a contract manufacturer. Within in-house, you've got some different models. You could own the facility, you could lease the facility, uh, you could have someone else operate the facility. And then within contract manufacturing, you've got some options you don't have to go all in. You could have just contract manufacturing for the process or just contract manufacturing for the packaging portion, just a potentially a portion of it if that works with your strategy. So things to consider as we think about your own facility in-house, uh, I think one of the big things is that upfront capital expense. So there are certainly some capital and asset light models we're seeing and even you know manufacturing as a service um, where you're to a certain extent, you know, quote unquote, owning your facility, right, in, in some sort of uh, lease arrangement. But generally, I think your upfront capital versus contract manufacturing is going to be higher. When you've got your own facility, you probably have 
a little more limited flexibility. You've made your decision what your equipment looks like, what your facility considerations are. Again, back to that flexibility piece, you've probably built in some flexibility, but if you have a major shift or pivot, um, you might not have all the flexibility that you need. Potentially capacity constraints. So what, what if, what if, or when I should say, when, when your manufacturing takes off, when your product really takes off, how can you quickly scale that up? It might be a little slower than having a contract manufacturer you can go to and say, hey, I need to, I need to increase this now. You've got the added complexity of now you're hiring a manufacturing and operations team. So you're not just doing research and development anymore. Uh, you're not just doing sales, like you're, you're running the facility. Um, you do one of the things to consider your own facility. You are keeping all that intellectual property and trade secrets maintained in-house. Um, you know, as we know, just as, as more and more people know these things, you know, the potential of things to things to spread increases, right? So I think that's a potential benefit of, of your own facility. Um, you've also really got what I call total control. So product quality, if you don't like the quality of something, even maybe even if it's within your spec, you can make that decision, you know, hey, we're going to redo this. We're not going to, you know, we're not going to um, send this out. We're not going to sell it, whatever that might be. Same thing with production schedule. Hey, this package type really take took off or this product blend really took off. We're going to shift all of our uh, all, all of our manufacturing there. You can do that very quickly. It's your own facility. It's entirely your decision. So then as we go into contract manufacturing, and again, some of these are generalizations, but generally, I think you're looking at a long-term higher unit cost, um, potentially getting greater flexibility in production and volume with the right arrangement with a contract manufacturer. Maybe now you've got that flexibility to um, change up your production, change up your volume, almost on a dime. Um, I think the contract manufacturing gets you that quicker small batch availability for product testing. So you want to try out some ideas, you can quickly try them. You're not having to reconfigure your own facility. Um, you have to consider what technology are you looking at? What does your manufacturing look like? Is it a highly technical process? Is it something you could train a, um, an outsourced party, a contract manufacturer on? Going the contract manufacturing route, to some extent, you're probably having to share or they inherently find out some of your intellectual property and trade secrets. So that's now that's now going outside your sphere. Um, from a quality con control standpoint, you've really got this, what I call contractual governance. Your contract says, hey, these are the quality parameters. They produce it and it's within those parameters. You're generally contractually obliged to um, to pay for it, right? So as opposed to if this was your own facility, you didn't like something, even if it was in your spec, you could make that decision to, um, you know, to, to not take that product at that cost. Um, another thing to consider is could production be delayed for higher priority products? So does someone come in with more money? Does someone come in with a higher priority? Does someone say, hey, I really need this manufactured now? You're at the mercy of your contract manufacturer who um, you know might be might be making concessions for to work with others, right? And that you don't have that total control over your schedule as opposed to an in-house facility. Okay, so one of the things I also like to bring up is: is there a hybrid approach? Is there an opportunity to combine these? Maybe you're making, maybe you're doing the process in-house. You're making the raw product base. You're maintaining more of that intellectual property. Um, you know, um, uh, know how the technical depth, and maybe you're shipping it off in bulk to a contract manufacturer to package, for example. So potential hybrid approach to consider. Again, you know, I look at, I say, you know, when, whenever someone says, which way should I go? What makes sense? There, there's no magical answer. There's no, you must do it this way. Uh, you must not do it that way. There are different approaches that in-house versus contract. And then there's that hybrid uh, idea. Okay, last topic very briefly that I wanna to touch on is managing risk. So we've got all this risk that we're considering. So when I think about my typical food project in, in the traditional food and beverage industry, you know, my risks are, hey, how do I build this thing? What does it look like? What are the construction risks? Well, within the alternative protein space, food tech space, fermentation area, 
you've also got this complexity of that technological risk of that scale up. As you think of going through those technology readiness levels that we looked at, there's different levels of, hey, is my is my technology really mature? How is it going to work? What does it look like in addition to all these other risks? So we've got that technology, that scale up risk, financial risk. I brought up supply chain risk. I mean, from getting equipment and not just process equipment. I mean, we're seeing things like even electrical transformers um, that are significantly delaying projects because you're looking at um, you know, maybe an 18 month lead time for things like that. So you got to consider that supply chain. Of course, these are not all the risks that are that are there, but just something to start thinking about as you start thinking about those risks, as you look at the different type of risks. So there's what I call a positive risk, that opportunity, as well as the negative risk. And it's important to go through this risk analysis, go through the um go through the risk matrix continually throughout your design process. Uh, so some things you can do, you're really going the process, you're identifying the risks, so you're brainstorming, you're coming up with what are all these ideas, what could happen, you're analyzing the risks, you're figuring out what could happen, um, you know, what, what's the likelihood, what's the severity, things like that, prioritizing them, what's, you know, potentially limited money, limited time, how are we going to, uh, how are we going to address these? We'll treat the risk and then we'll monitor it and go through this cycle. So potential things, once you've got those risks identified, you know, things that you can do, you can avoid the risk, just make sure, you know, you're, you're going around it, um, mitigate it, maybe through procedures um, or whatnot, transfer it. Maybe there's a type of insurance or other, um, other construct to to transfer that you can accept the risk know that hey it may happen this is what's going to happen um you can share it maybe with multiple partners teams projects things like that um you know you're looking at that contingency on the positive side how do you enhance it you know maybe you have a, a risk of finishing early or under budget so how do you what can you do to make sure that's more likely to happen and then exploit so how can you make use of resources if the if the risk occurs? Maybe something that positive risk happens and now you can reassign personnel or reassign equipment. But really, you know, the big thing from a risk standpoint that, that I want to bring up, you know, it, it's an important part of any project. It is important to identify it. It's important to go through that assessment, that risk assessment to figure out what's the probability or likelihood or frequency that this is going to happen. And then if it happens, what's the impact? What's the severity? Based on that information, you can make some decisions on evaluating it, how you're going to rank them and how you're prioritizing them. So wrapping up, the, the one thing that always sticks out in my mind is how do we move forward together in this alternative protein ecosystem? It's not about any one company succeeding. It's really this whole ecosystem. It's whole, this, this whole industry succeeding and taking off. So I found this quote um, insightful and inspirational. It's from um, Edward Wilson uh, in his book, The Future of Life, it says, the problem before us is how to feed billions of new mouths over the next several decades and save the rest of life at the same time. So I like to apply it to what everyone here is doing, what we're doing, and it's just something I've found uh, inspirational and insightful. So that that's the other thought I want to leave you with is you know, how do, how do we move forward? So just wanted to wrap up really again, thank you, Good Food Institute. Thank you to to Audrey for putting this together. I hope you've got some ideas as we talked about, um, you know, what does it take from a manufacturing infrastructure standpoint? What do you really need to do to scale up? Certainly happy to to discuss one on one. Um, and thank you again for joining. Um, I think back to Audrey for uh, for some question and answer. Thank you so much, David. That was an incredible presentation. I know I learned a huge amount as you were going through those slides. So, so thank you very much. Um, we do have about 10 minutes now for some Q&A. Um, as a reminder to everyone, if you could just enter in your questions into the Q&A box, uh, that would be much appreciated. Um, that helps us keep track of them a little bit better. 
I don't know if we'll have time to make it through everything today. There are a lot of questions that have come in, but um, we'll jump right in and get started. Um, so to kick us off, David, our first question is around uh, transportation. And if you recommend locating manufacturing close to shipping and air cargo portals, um, thinking about that long-term view as companies might overlook those transportation costs. So I would say, it, it, as we saw, it's definitely a, a consideration. It's something you've got to evaluate. It's something you've got to balance from a, a location standpoint, along with a lot of other factors, right? So what is your what is your shipping volume? What does your transportation look like? How far away are you looking? What sort of shipping um, you know are you talking about? Do you have long-term plans to build a facility in another um, another country, uh, another geography within the U.S., things like that? So um, I, I don't want to oversimplify it and say, yes, you should be, you know, buy a shipping portal. But I think the the shipping and logistics, um, you know, is certainly something you don't want to overlook. That That's a key consideration. Great. And just uh, one quick reminder to everyone that we will be sharing uh, the a recording of this presentation with everyone. It will be in our YouTube channel. Um, we'll also be sharing the slides. Um, so rest assured, you will have access to all this great information after this ends. Um, for our, our next question, uh, where do you think the main bottleneck for scaling precision fermentation will be in five years? Will it be around the biological chemistry? Uh, engineering, manufacturing capacity, capital, consumer readiness. Do you have any thoughts around uh, the main bottlenecks for scaling precision fermentation? Sure. So, you know, I, I figure this is going to be recorded and someone's going to check me in five years, right, to see where uh, where, where we actually ended up. Um, mm -hmm. No, that, that's cer certainly a good question. You know, I think particularly in the, the precision fermentation space, right now we're starting to see the processes proven out. We're starting to see that engineering and manufacturing capacity start to come online. We're seeing more of an industry focus um, of even investment where I would say six to 12 months ago, I didn't really see a lot of interest in, you know, investing in those hard assets necessary, right, for this, um, for this industry. So we're starting to see some more interest there. So I, I think that's going to come off the table Um potentially under five years. Um, so along with that, that capital piece. Um, so, but maybe, you know, as we talk about consumer readiness, I think that's a real key item, whether we look at whether it's precision fermentation, whether it's cultivated meat, this whole idea of what is the consumer messaging? What do consumers see? What do consumers respond to and say, you know, oh, I'm not going to eat that, or I'm not willing to try that. It's really that that consumer readiness, but you know, part of that's that messaging of what do we need to do to help explain this better, explain the science, make people comfortable with with what we're talking about, um, so it it doesn't get shunned. Thanks, David. I uh, I agree with all those those comments that you made, and and we'll be uh, going back to this in five years to see if you were right. Uh, switching gears a little bit to sustainability, uh, this is a, a question slash comment about um, the measurements for many of the processes that you outlined, um, because scope one, two, and three emissions uh, will always be an issue and a measurable reporting concern. Um, do you have any thoughts on sustainability measurements when it comes to infrastructure? So I think just, you know, measurement in general, we want to make sure we're we're measuring so we at least know what we have, what we're talking about, what we're dealing with. Um, you know, one of the interesting things, sort of my observation, is if you think about traditional food and beverage, uh, sustainability has been more of a an add-on, right? You have an existing manufacturing process. How do we make it more sustainable? Okay, you know, do, do we put solar panels on on the roof? Do we monitor the water? Do we try and reduce our water? Things like that. As opposed to a lot of what we're seeing in the alternative protein space, especially within like cultivated meat, precision fermentation, we're seeing a lot more interest of how do you design sustainability into the process? So of course, as we have something like that designed into the process, I think we're inherently more sustainable. Uh, we have clients who are looking at, at this stage from a, um, you know, what their true sustainability impact is, 
they're looking at suppliers, they're looking at throughout their entire process. So I would say from a measurement standpoint, I would certainly recommend you're, you're always measuring these, right? That's generally the lower cost. Um, you can at least see what the impact is and then figure out how do we address it, when we address it, what makes sense, because there, you know, frankly, there's always a cost concern with sustainability. And, um, you know, as much as I think idealistically, we'd like everything to be very sustainable, uh, there, there's a cost impact. And if it's going to cost, uh, you know, significantly more to build your facility and add a, a sustainability angle to it, maybe that really interrupts the whole model as opposed to monitoring it and making adjustments down the line. So a um, little bit, a little bit of a, a long way to, to say, I mean, I think the measurement piece is important. You know, I think these are going to continue to be issues as, as we see through the news, as we see other companies sort of kicking those, uh, uh, kicking those cans down the road. So I, I think it's important to monitor and know, you know, what, what your true, cost of production is from a uh, emission standpoint. Thanks, David. And uh, Molly just posted this in the chat, but GFI uh, will is working on an ESG framework um, that we will be releasing soon. So stay tuned for that, everyone. Uh, moving ahead, um, about four minutes left. How do bench scale project life cycle estimations compare with real life, with, with real life product demand cycles? That's a good question. So maybe we're thinking about, hey, we, we've estimated this. I'm not really sure maybe on the demand side from the consumer standpoint, but maybe thinking about like production of like, hey, we're at the lab scale, we're on the bank, here's what we're projecting maybe our yields are versus what we're getting out at the um, commercial stage. So if I'm, if I'm thinking about it from that angle, um, you know, go, going from that, taking that big jump from lab to commercial scale, if you look at, you know, those technology readiness levels, I mean, that's a pretty big jump to make, right? And you've got more room for error from a, what your output is, what your costs are, what your schedule is, as opposed to having that, that middle pilot stage or that middle demonstration facility where you're able to figure out, okay, this is where we want to go commercially. So this is what my pilot experiments, these are what, how my experiments need to be designed in order to get this data and move forward. Thank you. And and moving over to a question about equipment, uh, how do you coach your customers in selecting scale-up equipment? Are there any rules of thumb that you have them think about there? So I, I would say in general, it, it's really about the function and what you're trying to do. So, you know, I don't know there's a, for example, like, you know, a, a, a cost rule of thumb, you know, I think would be tough to to give without specifics but as you think about scale up it's really thinking about the function so i use the example of particularly within cultivated meat so you've got this bioprocess that's typically been pharma right but as soon as you say pharma what does that do to the cost of equipment that probably gets you outside the scale of what's going to really make sense from a food standpoint so i just encourage you to look at what's the function you need what are you trying to accomplish and then how do we get there? Great. We have time for probably one more question, maybe two. Uh, so the next one is, how can we mitigate loss in the detailed scope before we scale onto the construction scenario? Do you have any thoughts on that? So I, I think maybe uh, I'm just assuming loss being like loss in the engineering design, like maybe some rework in engineering. And so I think that's part of the challenge of when do you start this process and how much information do you have? I think particularly in this industry, I don't think you're ever going to start with perfect information. I mean, if you're waiting till all your scale up experiments are done to know exactly what you need, you're probably too late to really get off the ground from a commercial standpoint, uh, from a timing, you know, from a, a timing standpoint. So, but I think you can iterate in there. So I think you can have some basic knowledge, you can have some basic ideas of what this should look like. Think maybe, hey, we're, you know, reasonably confident this is the right size, or this is the right size of process equipment. So let's put that as a more certain function, and then know that maybe we leave enough flexibility and leave enough space that we can make those changes so that we're minimizing that amount of rework while still getting to our, our end desired result. 
Great. Thank you, David. Uh, so it looks like we're at the top of the hour. So that's about all we have time for today. Thank you, everyone, for joining. And remember to please join us over on Meetaway. I know that David will be there, uh, some of his colleagues at Black and Beach. So there may be an opportunity to connect and, and ask more questions there. So we look to see, look forward to seeing you all soon. And thank you. Bye, everyone.